I'm going to start with just a little bit of a story, uh, the context for what I'm talking about today. So imagine you just uh, completed your latest application and you're ready to deploy it, right? You finished your Rails app, your Node app, whatever you're building, and it's ready to go to prod. And so you think to yourself, that the microphone is going to make noise. So you think to yourself, uh, okay, I'm going to use AWS. It's popular. Everyone seems to be doing it. Great. So you log into the AWS console for your first time, and you see a screen that looks something like that, which is a little terrifying. Uh, and you probably feel a little bit like that. It's okay. You spend a few hours reading documentation, browsing Stack Overflow. Uh, eventually, you get things more or less sorted out, and you got a single server up and running. Now what? Well, you keep reading, and uh, you realize that one server is probably not a great way to run a production site, so you probably need multiple servers. So now you start learning about auto-scaling groups and availability zones, and of course, if you have multiple servers, now you gotta put a load balancer in front of them, so now you're learning about ALB and ELB and NLB, and somewhere you gotta store your data, so now you're deploying databases and failovers and hard drives, and then, uh, I guess files, we'll put those in S3. I don't really know what S3 is, so I'm gonna go spend some time learning about that. And IAM policies. I guess I need monitoring and alerting, so now you have CloudWatch up there. And then you realize everything you've been doing is in public, is exposed to the public internet, because you deployed it into the default VPCs. So now you're kind of terrified, and you spend a lovely week of your life reading about VPCs and subnets and route tables and NAT gateways and redeploying absolutely everything from scratch. Then you figure out I need a DNS entry, and maybe you need a TLS cert, and maybe you need to encrypt and decrypt secrets. And of course, you need more than one of these, right? You have two environments, you might have five environments, you'd have 10 environments. So now you gotta manage all of this craziness. So you're looking into tools, you grab Terraform, you grab Docker, you're learning all of these new technologies. Now you gotta test everything, so now you're bringing in your CI servers, and you gotta have alerts when things go wrong, so you hook those up, and then your life looks something like that. <laughs> Does that sound right? D does, is this what DevOps and infrastructure feels like? So this is your life, <laughs> but it gets worse, because now you have to maintain all of it forever. And that's actually really hard. Uh, last year alone, AWS had 1,000 new releases. And if you look at this lovely chart, that's, that's not slowing down. So you have a thousand new things you have to think about. That web page you log into is getting bigger, much bigger. Uh, Terraform has a release every couple weeks, faster now since they broke out all the providers. And maybe worst of all, there's security vulnerabilities every day. If you want to feel really sad about the state of our industry, sign up for a bunch of security advisories, and you could almost turn it into a drinking game. You know, Take a shot every time there's a Linux vulnerability, a WordPress vulnerability. It's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty terrifying. So I think this is even a better representation of what a lot of us feel like on a daily basis. So there's a better way to do this. There's a better way to manage your infrastructure, to deploy infrastructure that makes this a little bit less painful. And that's to use modules. So that's the topic of today. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about how to build reusable, composable, battle-tested infrastructure code. That's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll, I'll break that down throughout the talk. Uh, the goal is I'll walk you through how Terraform modules work, and I'll walk you through how you're going to be able to turn that into a couple pretty simple commands. That's our goal. Uh, I'm Evgeny Berkman. I go by the slightly easier to pronounce nickname Jim, so feel free to call me Jim. Uh, author of a couple books. Uh, who's read Terraform Up and Running? That's amazing. All right, now I feel good. Um, and co-founder of a company called Gruntwork. And at Gruntwork, we've been mo building uh, Terraform modules for a couple of years, actually. And we've been using them to help our customers get up and running with all of their infrastructure defined as code. And at this point, using modules, we can do it in about a day. Uh, outline of the talk, we're gonna talk about what modules are, where they fit in, in the world. Uh, we'll talk about how to use a module. Uh, we'll talk about how modules work, and that third section, that's probably the meat of the talk. That's where we'll go through all the, the nitty-gritty details of what's happening under the hood and why, uh, why modules are going to be useful for just about all use cases. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what modules are going to look like in the future. So let's start with what's a module. 
the question I'm going to answer here is where do modules fit? Why should you use them? What, what's new about this? So right now, if you're, if you're deploying infrastructure, you're really dealing with two types of providers. Uh, this is a simplification, but it's, I think it's a reasonably accurate picture of the world. Uh, one is you, you can use infrastructure as a service. Uh, that's things like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. Uh, these are providers that they give you essentially a bunch of small standalone primitives. And it's up to you to figure out how to put all of those together. And as you can see in that diagram, there's a lot of things to put together. Uh, the second option, which tends to be a layer on top of infrastructure as a service, is platform as a service. Uh, that's things like Heroku, Docker Cloud, Engine Yard. And these tend to hide all of those low-level low details from you, and they give you this nice high-level API, right? Here's how you deploy an app. Here's how you deploy a database, instead of focusing on routing together VPCs and subnets. So the advantage of platform as a service is it makes it very, very easy to get started. Hopefully you guys can read that. Uh, you can basically create your app in whatever language. You run Heroku Create, and you do a Git push, and you have it live. All of that stuff, that giant diagram, more or less is done. But there are downsides. So there's a lot of limitations to most platform as a service. By the way, I'm picking on Heroku. I don't mean to be mean to Heroku. I actually really like Heroku. But it's a platform as a service by design. Because they hide those underlying details, there's going to be a lot of limitations. You can only deploy certain types of apps in certain supported languages that work over uh, certain protocols, namely HTTP and HTTPS. You have a bunch of limits built in. It's hard to debug. It's hard to customize. It's hard to scale. So what tends to happen is most software companies, once they grow, they might use a platform as a service to launch. But once they grow beyond a certain size, uh, they tend to all fall back to infrastructure as a service, which means everyone is living this life. So we're developers. We know how to fix these things. We know that it can be done better. Uh, you know, anytime you see a pain point, you should think there's an opportunity here. And the solution is to use code, right? Programmers, you know, you can always just add another layer of abstraction. And uh, specifically, we're going to use Terraform to uh, improve the situation a little bit. Now, I'm guessing most of you know Terraform, but there's always a small percentage that have never used it, and they're going to be very lost in this talk. So I'm going to do a very, very quick primer on Terraform. So bear with me if you already know all of this stuff. I'll also be doing live coding today, so you, you're all going to be highly entertained when things go horribly wrong. OK, so this, uh, so first of all, actually, let me talk about what Terraform is. Terraform is uh, a tool for provisioning infrastructure. The idea is you're going to be able to write code that specifies how to deploy servers, databases, load balancers, your network topology. All of these pieces, you can capture them as code. And Terraform in particular works with a number of uh, different providers. So AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, DigitalOcean, pretty much anything you'd want is supported. Uh, within each provider, there's a number of resources you can create. That's over here in this left column. And this is essentially the Hello World uh, Terraform example. Can you guys read that OK? Yeah. Great. So uh, at the top, we specify which of the providers we want to use. For this example, I'm using AWS, and I'm going to tell it to deploy into US East 1. Uh, then we're going to create a bunch of resources for that provider. So here I'm creating an AWS instance. It's basically a virtual server. And it, within the body of this thing, I specify parameters for it. So the AMI says basically what virtual machine to run. I'm just running an empty Linux AMI. And the instance type says what type of server to run. So this is a tiny little server with a gig of RAM and one CPU. So what Terraform is going to do is it's going to read your code, and it's going to translate those into API calls to whatever providers you're using. So in this case, it's going to make a bunch of API calls to AWS. So here that, here's how that works. We'll go into the terminal. So I'm in the folder that has my uh, that main.tf file, that hello world example. And the first thing you do is you run Terraform init, and that'll download any plugins that you need. And then you run Terraform plan. How's the terminal looking from back there? Is that OK? All right, I'll have to scroll a little bit. Uh, so the plan command shows you what Terraform is going to do before it actually does it. Uh, it's a really great way to prevent you know, shooting yourself in the foot on a regular basis. So this plan output looks a little bit like a diff output, and it's saying it's going to create a single server for me. That's exactly what I want. Plan looks good. So to actually deploy it into your account, you run Terraform apply. And now Terraform is going to go read that code. It's going to find that I want an EC2 instance, and it's going to make the appropriate API calls to AWS to create that thing. 
We can actually see that happening in the background. If I go to my AWS account, and there we go, we have a server launching right now. So the server, actually, if you notice, doesn't have a name, so it's pretty easy to add a name. We can do that by adding some tags. We'll set the name to example. Okay, so that thing finished deploying. If I run plan one more time, now my plan is gonna look a little different. So now, Terraform is telling me that the server already ex exists, so it's not gonna create it again. It's gonna modify it by adding a tag. That looks pretty good. Let's run apply. All right. And if I refresh this, okay, my server is now called example. So believe it or not, for those of you that haven't used Terraform, that crash course is 60, 70% of what you need to know uh, to really use the tool. The rest is just learning what the resources are. Uh, there is one other thing in Terraform, though, which is quite relevant for this talk, which is this idea of modules. So the idea with a module is you can think of it as a blueprint. It captures in code how to, def uh, how to deploy certain type of infrastructure. Now, in my case, that might be a single server. In your case, that could be how your company manages, let's say, a microservice. So it might be a cluster of servers with a load balancer and database, et cetera. All of that can be packaged as a single module. The way modules work, and this is the last uh, primer that I'll do, so the rest of you can wake up in just a minute, um, uh, is any Terraform code in a folder is actually a module. So this code that I created here is technically a module. And all I need to do is use it as a module. So I'm gonna go into this other folder here called my service. And in here, I'm gonna use the module keyword. I'll call the module foo. And in the source parameter, I specify the path to where that module code is. So in that case, it's in that folder. So that is gonna reuse all the code I have in this folder, which in this case is creating a server. So if I go into that folder, I'll run terraform init. I'll run plan, and it should tell me that it's gonna create one server. Okay, there we go. So modules are pretty easy to use. Uh, what's cool is, of course, I can reuse this code now. I can create a second module called bar, and now if I run Terraform plan, it should tell me that it's gonna create two servers. So there we go, plan two to add, so there's one server, and there's the other. And the other great thing about modules is I can make them configurable. So for example, in the module itself, I, de I can declare a variable called instance name, and instead of hard coding the name, I can set it to that variable, and now when using the module, I can set that variable to different values. So this service is called foo, and this one is called bar. So if I run plan one more time, what you'll see is the first server has the tag set to foo, and the second one has it set to bar. Okay, everybody following along with modules? Anybody find that confusing? Okay, cool. So that is hopefully all the primer you're gonna need to understand the rest of the talk. Okay, so, talked about that. All right, so why do we care about these modules? What's the point, what is the advantage? The advantage is if you package your code correctly, and you can obviously do it wrong, but if you do a good job of packaging your code as a module, then you're gonna be able to use infrastructure as a service. So you have all that control, all the power that you need for your company. But you're gonna have a layer on top of it which is almost as easy to use as a platform as a service. You'll be able to speak in a higher level language. Instead of talking about VPCs and servers and CPUs and databases, you can talk about your app, your microservice, your entire infrastructure could actually be a module. And so that makes it much, much easier to manage all of those thousand and one things that you have to deal with. And what's really important is with modules, you have the code. So not only do you have the higher level API, but you can still see what's happening under the hood. You can modify it, you can customize it, and we'll see a lot more of that a little later in the talk. The other great thing, as you may have heard this morning, is you can share modules. So one of the things that was announced this morning is the Terraform module registry. This is a public collection of modules that you can grab and use in your code so that you don't have to build the code at all. You can allow somebody else to do it and maintain it for you. Uh, I have heard rumors that the registry is having issues. Uh, it, it, it made it to the front page of Hacker News, so that's always a good and a bad thing. Okay, it's, it seems to be up. So this is the module registry. Um, it's still certainly early days, but you can find some useful modules in here. You can search, as it suggests, oh, cool, it's working, for console. 
So there's a module for console in Azure, in Google Cloud, in AWS. And if you click on one of these, you can see the code that's in there. You can see it pulls up the documentation, whatever diagrams are in there. Uh, it'll tell you about what input variables that module requires uh, and which ones are optional, what outputs, what resources, uh, who created it, all of this information is here. And there's a bunch of these, and obviously this thing is gonna grow quite a bit over the future. So here's Vault, for example, uh, which was mentioned quite a bit in the keynote. Uh, there's now a module to deploy Vault very quickly and easily, and I'll show you that a bit later on. Okay, so I always have screenshots in the background in case live demo goes bad, so I have to skip through a couple screenshots. All right, so that's what's a module, that's where it fits. How do you use the modules in the registry? That's the next question. So as an example, uh, let's talk about Vault. You want to deploy Vault because you want to secure your secrets, you want encryption as a service. It's a pretty nice tool. The old way of doing it looked something like this. And raise your hand if this is familiar. You open up the Vault documentation and you spend a few hours reading it. You then deploy a few servers, you install Vault on them, you install some sort of process supervisor, you generate some self-signed certs because you want everything to go over TLS. Then you start learning about the Vault configuration file, you create the S3 bucket for it, you try to fire up the server, you get a crazy error, you spend two days of your life figuring out what the hell this error is, you find out that Vault is very picky about the self-signed certs and only accepts certain encryption algorithms, you flip a couple more tables over, you get that working, then you find out for high availability you need console, so then you open up the console documentation, you start reading that, you fire up a couple servers, okay, that's the old way. The new way is gonna look a little different. The new way, you're gonna run Terraform init, and you're gonna run Terraform apply. And when you're done, you're gonna have this. So you're gonna have a uh, vault cluster uh, that's gonna use S3 as a storage backend, and you're gonna have a console cluster. And vault is gonna use that as a high availability backend, and you'll have all the IAM rules, and you have everything else that you need for this thing to run. Uh, I'll show you guys a quick demo of that. So the one thing I'll caution about is that this Terraform init command uh, that I'm using, the syntax did not make it in time for the release, so for now you're just gonna have to git clone the repo, uh, which is gonna do essentially the same thing. So what we'll do uh, is you'll go find the module you wanna use, grab its, uh, uh, open its GitHub page, grab the clone URL, and essentially on your computer, you would run git clone and paste that in and hit enter. That's gonna do essentially the same thing that that init command did. It just takes an extra step. Okay, I've already done that. Um, and so what we're gonna do in here is I have the result of what was cloned to my computer, which is a whole bunch of files. That's probably a little too big of a font. All right. Oops, that's too small a font. All right, how about that? You guys, folks in the back can read? Awesome. So this is the, uh, after you run init or get clone, this is the code you have on here. So let's run terraform init in here. Make sure all the modules are there, all right. Before we run apply, probably you should run plan. It's a good way to make sure it's gonna do what you expect it to do. So let's see what the plan shows us for Vault. Okay, so this thing is gonna create 33 resources, and you're welcome to browse through and see what it's doing. There's all sorts of security group rules in here, IAM policies, uh, auto scaling groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that looks good. We'll just pretend I read all that and I'm gonna hit apply to actually start deploying. It's gonna take a couple minutes to spin up the clusters, so we'll let that run in the background. Uh, in the meantime, what I wanna show you is what actually got checked out. So what got checked out is not this, but this. So it's a bunch of code. Uh, at the top, you may recognize the same sort of provider configuration, uh, what version of Terraform we wanna use, the AMIs. Here's our vault cluster. This is gonna be an auto-scaling group with the vault nodes in it. I am policies for user data script, load balancer, here's console uh, cluster that's being deployed, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what got checked out on my computer. What's cool is if I want to, I can ignore all of that. I can just run like I just did, Terraform plan, Terraform apply, and I'm good to go. It's gonna deploy that whole thing. I can start playing around with it, learning. You, know, you get to start with working code rather than a pile of documentation. But if I wanna customize it, I still can because I have all of the code. So some of you probably already have console running. You don't want to deploy a new cluster. Cool, no problem. You go into this code, here's the console cluster. I don't want it, so delete it. Congratulations, you have full control over all of this code. You can run Terraform apply and now it'll deploy without the console cluster and you can change the configuration to use your own cluster. 
That's the basic idea, is you have essentially something uh, that is as easy to use as a platform as a service. It's not hosted for you, so platform as a service still does more, but you have this nice high-level API that just says vault, and you don't have to worry too much unless you want to. And if you want to, you open up the code, you edit it, and you make the changes that you want. Okay, let's see if that thing deployed in the background. Okay, so that finished deploying, provides a bunch of useful outputs. There's also a handy little script in here uh, that will essentially wait for the servers to actually come up and for console to automatically bootstrap itself for everything to connect. Uh, okay, there we go. So I guess everything actually booted up. And so now it gives you some useful output. My vault servers are running at these IP addresses. Uh, I need to basically initialize and unseal my server. So we can actually do that. I'll copy that. SSH, yes. Okay, there's my server. Let's make sure console is all right. It's able to talk to console, no problem. I don't know how readable that output is at this font size, but hopefully you get the idea that the console server came up. Now I can run vault status to see what's going on. It says it's not initialized. Now we can initialize it. Basically, you have vault. You can use it. Now you can all see my secret keys. This is the best security possible. Uh, but you have a fully working cluster. You have fully working code that you can edit. That's really what the goal is here. Okay, so what's happening under the hood is, is actually very, very important. Uh, because a lot of people are probably thinking to themselves, well, that's a neat demo. You deployed the vault cluster the way you wanted it, but I have special needs that are different, so there's no way this is gonna work for me. Um, and you're probably wrong, <laughs> so here's why. Uh, so to understand the design philosophy be behind modules and what you, how you really wanna build them, it's actually good to look at other programming languages. So in other programming languages, this is vaguely Python, uh, you have functions, right? If you have a piece of code that you wanna use in a bunch of place, you put it in a function. The function has a name, it takes input parameters that have names, it returns uh, outputs, and the cool thing about it is you can use it all over the place. You define the function once, and you can use it again and again throughout your code. You can also test the function, right? It's hard to test a gigantic application, but a single little function, you can actually test and make sure it behaves the way you want to, which allows you to build on top of these nice tested building blocks. Another really powerful idea with functions is composition. You can have multiple functions and you can use them together. You can pass the outputs of one as the inputs into another. And finally, abstraction. So you can have a function that does something really, really complicated. And the body of the function has a large volume, so to speak, it's doing a lot. But the API that the function exposes, the surface area, is very small. So it abstracts away all of that complexity. So that's why I use functions in normal programming languages. And for the exactly the same reasons, we're going to try to build our modules in Terraform so they have all the same properties. So that they're reusable, so that they're testable, so that they abstract away complexity, uh, and so that they're composable. Those are our goals. So what does a simple module look like? You've already seen the simple module. It's basically a few files in a folder that create some resources. Uh, the typical naming conventions that you should be using uh, is any inputs to your module, kind of like the inputs to a function. Those go into a variables.tf file, and you can put a description for each of them so humans can actually know what that variable's for. Uh, the outputs for the module should go into outputs.tf. Now people know what the module returns, so to speak. And then everything else, the actual resources you create, go into main.tf, and usually it's a good idea to have some documentation for your code uh, in a readme file. And the Terraform registry will pick up all of this automatically, it'll parse all of this automatically and show it correctly in the UI, especially if you're following these conventions. So that's a simple module. And some of the modules in the registry, that's all they are, just a few Terraform files in a folder. But there are more complicated modules, and how you build these is very important. So a more complicated module, it's gonna have the same basic files. You still have the, the Terraform code in the root, you still have documentation, but we're gonna add three new folders. And those folders are modules, examples, and test. So the modules folder will have what we call sub-modules. There's a little bit of terminology uh, confusion here, so these are also modules, technically. Uh, so these sub-modules, each of them is gonna solve one orthogonal problem in whatever the overarching thing is. So to make that a little more concrete, let's look at the actual Vault code. So here's the modules <laughs> folder for Vault. And what you'll find is the Vault implementation actually consists of a large number of these sub-modules. 
There's one here, for example, that defines just how to run the auto scaling group for Vault. There's a completely separate module that deploys the load balancer, because not everyone is gonna need a load balancer, so by putting it in a separate submodule, you now have that option to include it or not. Uh, there's a separate module for security group rules. There's a separate one for actually generating that self-signed cert that actually works correctly, is just a separate submodule. Uh, there are even submodules that are not in Terraform at all, because one of the things that you need to do with Vault is install it on your OS and run it, which Terraform doesn't really do for you. So there's actually bash code. There's a nice, well-documented bash script that'll install Vault. If you wanna use it, you're welcome to. If you wanna use something else, Ansible, Chef, whatever you prefer, you're welcome to do that because it, this code is in a separate submodule. They're all standalone, that's the key. And so the power of something like this, if you design it correctly, is that uh, these submodules, they each handle one use case. So one of them, for example, we use to build the Amazon machine image that has Vault installed and has a TLS certificate. We have a separate submodule that runs the cluster, a separate one for handling the S3 bucket another one for security group rules, another one for load balancer. And so you are welcome to use all of these together. If this is exactly what you wanted, you're done. You don't have to change anything. But if you have custom needs, and everyone has a little bit of custom, you'll probably be able to use 80% of this, but the 20% you wanna customize, you can swap it out for your own code. Maybe you use some other load balancer instead of the one that we deploy, and maybe you wanna use Chef to configure your servers, you can do that and still use the other submodules. The examples folder is essentially executable documentation. It shows you how to use all those different submodules in different permutations. So for example, if we look at Vault again, you'll find in the examples folder, we have a root example, which is kind of the de facto one. There's a private cluster, and you can read through how to deploy a completely private cluster that's not accessible from the public internet, which is, by the way, the recommended deployment model for most use cases. Uh, there's an example of how to build an AMI an Amazon machine image uh, for Vault, and that uses those scripts to install Vault, configure it. Uh, so there's a bunch of example code in here. And what's worth mentioning is that root example, the one that I deployed right at the beginning, uh, the one that sits here in this root folder, it's actually, it is an example. So the code at the root for these complicated modules, it's actually an opinionated uh, canonical example. That's kind of the really quick, you wanna just get up and running with Vault, here's the example. If you want something custom, uh, something custom, you can look at the other examples, you can look at this one, and you can shuffle things around and make them work the way you want it to. So that's examples. Uh, let's see. And by the way, some of the examples combine not only submodules from Vault, but also submodules from console or even completely other systems. So w Vault we tend to use with, with console. Uh, so we're using the console Terraform module in the example code as well. And so that, if you actually think about it, is function composition, right? We have one function that deploys vault, we have one function that deploys console, and now we can cleanly put them together and take the outputs from one and send them as the inputs to another. Finally, we have the test folder. Not every module is gonna have tests. Uh, we try to test absolutely everything we build. And I wish I could tell you that testing is easy, uh, and that I have some magical sauce that I'm just gonna offer to you and you're all gonna be able to snap your fingers and have well-tested uh, Terraform modules. Uh, the reality is it's not. And the reason for that is it's the type of language we're dealing with. If you're using Ruby or Python or some general purpose programming language, uh, you're able to do unit testing. You're able to isolate some part of your code from the rest of the outside world and test just that code. And those tests are very predictable, they run really quickly, and those allow you to have these nice, well-tested building blocks. With Terraform, and really any infrastructure as code tool, you don't have that, because the whole purpose of Terraform and infrastructure as co and code is to talk to the outside world. It's to make API calls to AWS and Azure and Google Cloud. So you can't really have a unit, because if you remove the outside world, there's nothing left. So pretty much all of your tests for Terraform are inherently gonna be integration tests. So that does mean they're gonna be a bit slower, that does mean they're gonna be a little more flaky because things in the outside world tend to change and break. Uh, and it does mean that you're, it's gonna take you a little longer to write them. But they're also extremely valuable. Uh, we're actually able to maintain a pretty large library of modules precisely because each one of them has thorough automated tests. So how do you test them? There's no real magic. I'll show you the code and you'll see very quickly that this is not magic at all. 
So if we open up the test folder, uh, we actually have a test case for each of the examples, uh, which is good, because then when you try the examples, they hopefully actually work. Uh, we write our test in Go. We have a little DSL library we wrote that's essentially a wrapper for running Terraform apply, Packer build, for running SSH commands. It's just a Go wrapper for all of that. And if we dive into the code, uh, the test looks something like this. I'm gonna skip over some of the little fine details, but we pick a random AWS region to deploy into to make sure that the code doesn't have a bug specific to US East 1 or some region like that. We run that sub-module I showed you earlier to generate a self-signed cert, and under the hood, this is just running Terraform apply. We run Packer build to build our AMI. And you're, and you're welcome to you know, dig into the code and see what's going on here. It's literally running a shell command that's packer and build. Um, we then take that AMI ID, plug it into our Terraform code, and then we run deploy, which is really just running Terraform apply. So the way tests work is you run Terraform apply to deploy the code into a real account. You're then gonna validate that that thing works the way you expect it to, and then you're gonna run Terraform destroy to clean up. It's not magic, it's just what you would have done manually, but you can automate it with a little bit of work. So we run Terraform apply, now we're gonna make sure that the vault cluster works the way we expect it to, and you can read the code, we're gonna establish a connection to the cluster, we're gonna wait for vault to boot up, we're gonna run that init command that I showed you earlier, so here we go, we literally SSH to the box and run vault init, uh, we're gonna grab the keys that it returns, and we're gonna use them to unseal the nodes, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna go through that whole flow after every single commit to make sure this thing works the way we expect it to. And we can do that because we build the module just once, right? Instead of building it for every single company individually, we build the module once, so we can take some extra time to really test this thing and make sure it works. That's the beauty of reuse. That's the leverage you get from modules. So we do all of that, we make sure this thing works as expected, and then you may have seen it here, we add a defer, which will basically run Terraform destroy at the very end, whether or not the test succeeded or through an exception or anything else. That's why you put it in a defer. So that is testing in a nutshell. It's a messy business. Uh, it's very, very valuable. Uh, hopefully we'll get slightly better tooling over time for doing this. Um, so I showed you guys that stuff. Okay, using a module we've talked about. Uh, using simple modules, complicated modules, it's essentially the same. Uh, you can point at the root and get that nice canonical example uh, in your source variable up here, or you can point at any of the submodules. So you're well, welcome to glue the submodules together in a variety of ways. Again, function composition. You can call this little function and this little function and this little function, glue all of their values together uh, to fit your use case and still be using this nice tested code under the hood. You get abstraction because you get the simple API in front of something that's pretty complicated, like Vault. You get reuse, because you can use that module many, many, many times. And you get one other thing, which is a pretty powerful idea. And again, if you do this right, it's just gonna change how you build infrastructure and how you manage your infrastructure, which is versioning. So, so far, the source parameter up there, we've set it to a file path, just a local folder on my computer. But you can actually set that file path with the newest version of Terraform to a registry URL, and so it'll download it from the registry. You can also set it to a Git URL to have it download from any of your Git repositories. And what's really cool is uh, for both registry URLs and Git URLs, you can specify a specific version. And you can set this to essentially a Git tag is what you're usually gonna point it at. So now you're using a very specific, fixed, immutable version of your module. And that's a powerful idea. So most modules, they're gonna use semantic version, versioning so you know if the change is backwards compatible or not. And you're gonna get better infrastructure just by bumping a version number. So as Vault has new releases, the Terraform module for Vault will have new releases, and you'll be able to upgrade by bumping a version number. But what's really neat is when you start doing this for your own infrastructure. If you build a module inside of your own code base that's how you deploy your microservices, or how you deploy your databases, or maybe how you deploy your entire infrastructure, could be a module, you can version it. You can create this immutable artifact that represents your infrastructure. And now, you can take that artifact and you can promote it from environment to environment to environment, right? This is the ultimate version of immutable infrastructure. It's not just an app that we're moving from one environment to the next. We're moving the entire infrastructure definition. That's immutable, 
from one environment to the next. And you can be reasonably confident that if this thing worked in the QA environment, then because the code doesn't change at all when you move it to stage, it'll probably work in stage. And if it works there, it'll probably work in prod. So this is beautiful, and this is a very powerful concept. Uh, if you start using it, your infrastructure, just the way you manage it will feel completely different. Okay, final thing before I let you all go eat, I'm actually doing pretty good on time, uh, is the future of modules. So the summary of the talk is something like this, brought to you by your sysadmin, Tyler Durden. It's basically that uh, your infrastructure isn't that unique. I don't want to burst your bubble or anything, but the reality is you all recognize this diagram. All of you want this, basically. You all need this. All of you need this, right? So everyone has the same general underlying needs, right? Your applications are very different. How you use that infrastructure is very different. But the underlying infrastructure is more or less the same. And what makes me a little sad as a developer is that we have thousands and thousands and thousands of developers building the same infrastructure, running into the same bugs, having the same security holes in a thousand different companies, right? If you drive down any road in Austin, in New York, in Silicon Valley, you're gonna go by somebody trying to deploy Vault, trying to deploy Kafka, trying to deploy Mongo. Why? It's the same. Why are we all wasting time on doing the same thing over and over again? Uh, we need to stop reinventing the wheel. It's, it's not healthy, it's not secure, it's slowing us down. And so the, the takeaway uh, from this talk is uh, basically a few things. One, you should be building on top of battle-tested code, not something you threw together today after reading the documentation for an hour, but something that's been tested in production, something that's been used by many, many different people. Ideally, it's commercially supported. So some of the modules in the registry are backed by companies who will provide support in case things go wrong or if you need help with a module. But most importantly, build on top of code. And I think this is very much in line with HashiCorp's philosophy as well, is the key abstraction, the key tool is code. You don't want to manage your infrastructure by hand. You don't want to be clicking around a user interface to do it. That doesn't work. Uh, and you don't want to really be using platform as a service for really large things as well, because again, you don't have the power or control that you need. Uh, you want to use code. Code is where all of this power comes from. And the advantages of code are pretty amazing. So you get reuse, right? If you had a sysadmin in one company that spent six months figuring out how to run uh, MongoDB, then a sysadmin in another company will have to spend, again, six more months doing it. If you capture that in code, the, first wor the work from the first person is immediately reusable by the second. You can compose modules. If you build your modules correctly, they can be extremely reusable for a very wide variety of use cases. Uh, you can configure them by exposing parameters. You can customize them because you have the code so you're welcome to modify it. You can debug things, because again, you can see the code and see what's happening. You can write automated tests. It's not easy, but it's doable. Uh, and that allows you to build your infrastructure on top of well-tested pieces. You can version the code, so that you can promote that infrastructure from environment to environment, and you can document it. Uh, I'm sure some of you have been at a company where there's one person that knows how the infrastructure works. They clicked around for a while to deploy everything, and if that person leaves, your company shuts down for a while. Um, with code, you can read the code. You can figure out what they did. It's captured for you. It is documentation. Uh, at Gruntwork, we've been building these modules for a couple years. Uh, we've gotten to the place where we have a bunch of companies all using the exact same infrastructure so that when one of them finds a bug, we can fix it for everybody. When we build a feature for one, we can push it out to everybody. And the result is that we can take this horrific, terrifying, familiar diagram and basically turn it into just a couple of commands. And now, uh, this got a whole lot easier with the release of the Terraform module registry. That's it, thank you very much.